Our scripture reading this morning comes from Isaiah. Without labor pains, Zion gives birth and bears an heir before any contractions begin. Has anyone ever heard of such a thing? Has anyone ever witnessed such a thing? Can a nation be born in one day, a country brought to birth in a moment? Yet Zion, as soon as she was in labor, has delivered heirs. Shall I open the womb and not deliver, says the Holy One? Shall I, the deliverer, close the womb, says the Holy One? Rejoice with Jerusalem and be glad because of her. All you who love her, exalt, exalt with her. All you who were mourning over her. Oh, that you may suckle fully of the milk of her comfort, that you may nurse with delight at her abundant breasts. For thus says the Holy One, I will spread peace over her like a river and the wealth of the nations like an overflowing torrent. As nurslings, you will be carried in her arms and fondled in her lap as a mother comforts her child. So ends our reading, ancient words from our tradition for our present day understanding. Well, we're at the halfway point on our sermon series on hope. Um, I know this is a very hard time for people who care about other people. If you're on that other side, then you're doing just fine. Um, but for social workers, for teachers, for people of compassion, people who are bigger than any one country or religion, this is a very brutal time. And so I've tried to think of things that might be at least a little helpful to you in um, getting through this time. I don't always do it right. Uh, I had three speeches yesterday, so I'm not gonna say which one this happened in. But after one of them, I talked about how this is a brutal time. It's a time of lies and uh, bullying and this kind of stuff. Somebody came up and said, I'm a Trump supporter. And I found that offensive and walked away, or something like that. And I thought what's interesting is I didn't, had, I didn't say Trump. <laughs> Isn't it interesting that saying the word lying and uh, bullying, the person self-identified <clears throat> and was offended when somebody would describe what they're doing to other people. So these are really hard times, right? Particularly those who want to be nice. We want people to like us. That's very understandable. And we need to be as nice and kind as we can be. But this is a time that needs prophetic faith, right? Faith that stands up for people that are being rolled over. But how do you hold on to hope at a time like this? When you look around you and it just looks like a desert and it's, you know, you lose a cactus every day. It's just getting really more of a margin landscape kind of look to it. How do you keep going? <clears throat> I'm going to try to, to talk about some ancient uh, truths that I hope will at least be partially helpful. It's an ancient principle that there's certain things in life you can't find you have to create. You have to birth them. Beauty sometimes isn't there around you, outside of you. And you want it desperately. And what all of us sometimes forget is that creativity is written inside us. We are expressions of the creative energies of nature, of the cosmos, whether or not you believe there's an invisible person doing things, you are an expression of a creative process. 
and creativity, art, takes you deeper into your own roots and can sustain you through the desert times, through the times when you look around you and there isn't anything of beauty or truth or goodness around you. There is still that creative capacity to create those things that are written inside of you. When Jesus said you were the light of the world, that didn't mean that you're always going to be in light places. It means that in the darkest of times, you were a God sent. To be kind in times of brutality, to be truthful in times of propaganda, that's what it means to be the light of the world. Now we're looking at Isaiah, <coughs> who's using a birthing image, <coughs> which I, I will use that to open the door, but you don't need my advice on birth. <laughs> at least half of you know more than I'll ever know in my whole life, right? So I can't help you on that if you have questions about that. But it's an allegory of the creativity in us all. In a time when Israel is in great distress and may not make it out, Isaiah is seeing that creativity being expressed. Something is being born. In the prayer concerns, could you add the death of all cedar trees? I know that sounds petty, but... No, I'm sure there's the plan there too. But one of the things you learn if you care enough about people over time is not everything happens for a purpose. I mean, that's what I was taught by professors in seminary. But if you live long enough, there's a lot of bad stuff that happens and you're, it drives you crazy to try to find rational reasons why something is happening. What is the lesson I can learn in this? It can drive you crazy trying to make sense of things. So I do not believe that everything happens for a purpose. But I think the truth of what our lesson is saying today is that there isn't anything that can happen to us that that creative energy in us can't find some beauty in or create some beauty in. Now the asterisk over the whole sermon is if you are in great pain today, Go on, on the line and, l and listen to this later because it's not going to help you today. There are situations in life where you, just, you don't need to hear how to get better. You're just trying to endure. And I'm not talking about that. These, the, even the greatest spiritual truths work most of the time. But there's always exceptions. For example, if you have children, that's an exception to every spiritual rule. In the world. You, <laughs> but you've got to fly by the seat of your pants. But there are just times when life is like that. But most of the time it helps. I used to suffer from migraines, and I'll, I'll knock on wood after the sermon, uh, that they don't come back again. But relaxing through the pain is helpful most of the time. But there are times when it just, like it snaps. Too much pain, I can't do it anymore. You know, I hit the wall, which doesn't make anything better, but it's very human. So now I've got a headache and a handache. But when you can to realize that trusting this creativity inside of you can give you hope even if you can't see it around you. In Taoism, there's a saying, you know, not to, not to um, interpret everything as good or bad. They say, rain after all is only rain. It is not bad weather. So also pain is only pain unless we resist it then it becomes torment. Again, that's helpful some of the time. The other times when you won't want to hear that. But in general, when we trust that creativity within us, what we discover is that even though life is often unfair, terribly unfair, we have a creativity inside us that can transform almost anything that happens. Probably some of your greatest life heroes discovered their spiritual depths in horrible times. 
Grief is something that hurts very much. None of us want to be in grief. But grief is one of the most creative processes in your body. To transform from what you've lost to hope for the future. It doesn't feel good when you're going through it. But it's not permanent. Know that something beautiful is being born through sometimes those very ugly, painful times. We had a service yesterday, and I, I'm so honored that some of the family has come, and uh, I hope you're not going to be sorry that you, that you did that. Um, but uh, Scott Kentros was just a wonderful, marvelous soul. We celebrated that yesterday. Um, it was in a place called the Cathedral, and it was full of people, just full of friends, uh, people that uh, had been touched by Scott, and lots and lots of artists, lots and lots of art. And I think that's really important at a time like this, because you see injustice in the country, and you may not realize that the most fundamental missing piece in the United States today is art, is the ability to empathize with somebody who's different. When you don't have empathy, you can't know what justice is. You see somebody across the border and you don't see that as your human family. Because some things the brain can't see, some things only the heart can, can see. So. This lesson is not asking us to oversimplify life in our head or find reasons why things are happening. It's calling us to trust that there is something within us. It may not make sense of our personal life, but it's a cosmic dance. I'll never forget years ago, uh, about 30 years ago <coughs> to be exact, I was doing a funeral. When I first got to this church, it was very conservative. <coughs> now you're a bunch of godless commie hippies. <laughs> I'm sorry, that was inappropriate. <laughs> but we were doing a very traditional service. And we did How Great Thou Art. And if you're young, you may, probably don't know that it was, sings my soul. My Savior God to thee. Nobody was crying. Everybody was just kind of sitting there. Then they do, I walk in the garden alone. I walk in the garden alone. <clears throat> the warble is very important. <laughs> Everybody's just sitting there. And there's this new song by Garth Brooks that the deceased loved. And they play this thing. And it says, um, let me. I'm not mess up Garth's line here. Uh, and now I'm glad I didn't know the way it all would end, the way it all would go. Our lives are better left to chance. I could have missed the pain, but I've had, I'd ha have had to miss the dance. And people started sobbing. That they're boo-hooing in the creative way. Grief is deeply creative. And these people, I realized at the time, okay, the old thing isn't going to work anymore. Right? There's no point in pulling that throttle down anymore. You know, if you weren't raised hearing those old hymns, they're just not going to do it for you. What I want to suggest is every person in this room has had some artistic expression where you felt the energy of life throbbing through you something being expressed through what you were doing. I don't care if you're an atheist. There are times when you have felt something primordial being expressed, and it was probably through art. My definition of enlightenment, which I've never shared before, the one I like, is falling in love with everyone and everything at the same time. That crush that we have on individuals, falling in love with the whole of life and letting it be expressed through our lives, through our art. 
there was something you used to do that put you in touch with your life energy. And you may have stopped doing that. And it may be because somebody laughed at you or convinced you that that was impractical. But we're going to talk about getting back to that place. When I was young, they had little trains and there was an electric track. I know they still have them, but um, you, you don't see them much. But there were electric trains, they had a track, and the train got its energy from the rails itself. The energy came up through the train, in a sense. And I think mysticism is understanding that's your situation too. For some of you, the, the sacred source is up in the sky and it looks like a person, an invisible person, which is kind of problematic in terms of what it looks like. But I think at some of your deepest moments, you may have felt something more profound than that, something you couldn't put in words, something that wouldn't go over in Sunday school. But somehow it spoke to your soul, to, to your roots. There's a very bad preacher illustration that I'm about to give you, which is very silly, but it's the best I've been able to find or come up with. There was once a, a big vat of milk and all of the workers were gone for the weekend and two frogs fell in the milk. One of them was a philosopher frog. The other was a ballerina frog. Now the philosopher frog looked around and saw, okay, logically there's no way out, right? The, everybody's gone, the walls are too hard, we, we, there's no way I'm gonna be able to keep going. This, so I'm just going to accept my fate and let it go. So he goes under the milk. The ballerina frog <coughs> agrees that may be true, but decides to make her last days beautiful. And so she dances. The next morning, they find one dead frog at the bottom of the vat, and the other frog is sitting on a pad of butter. <laughs> I told you, I told you, it's corny. But what I think that corny little story illustrates is, when we've checked out of life, when we're not being creative, when we're not expressing who we truly are, not only do we not get to spend our lives the way we want to, but we also miss the possibility that our art and creativity could change the equation of the world, of everything. That man who stood in Tiananmen Square, logically there was no sense in that. Who could have known that that would spread around the world? The person that held Martin Luther King in the nursery and helped him understand that he was a sacred gift to the world will never be recorded in history. But you don't know what your creativity can do in the world if you hold your light back and you don't let it shine. I want to suggest that creativity is the most radical political force in the universe. There are times I think we have to fight but the heart of revolution is never in the violence. It is always in the compassion of what's being protected. I've been to rallies where basically the basic theme is let's hate our way to peace. I've also been at rallies where people were just human. And the open heart transformed the definition of things. Think about when you felt connected to whether you called it God or nature. Was it an art you did? Was it a practice that you did? I want to suggest that's your sacred temple. Now, if it was marching uh, in a band with tubas, um, you may not be able to get quite that exact formula together. 
but you can get close enough to feel the energy of creativity coming through you. I met a woman one time who had been a dancer. I think she had a stroke, but she was paralyzed. And she said she wanted to create a wheelchair dancing troupe, which logically didn't make any sense to me until I saw them. And they were dancing with their hands, their arms, their head. Because the important thing was not the product or the performance. The important thing was expressing the life energy within them. And it was magnificent, as you might guess. But that has to come from within you. There is no preacher that's smart enough to help you get there. I promise you, I've been on the inside. It's uh, all bozos on this bus. <laughs> but there are people who help you find that deep uh, something within you. Do you remember Benjamin Spock, who had all this advice for women <laughs> on how to be mothers? That's what you don't need. Right? There is no external authority that can take you to your own heart. Expecting to get wisdom from a teacher alone, or a book, or religion, is like a chicken going to IHOP to try to get eggs. Another bad image, I, I agree. It's in you. It's waiting to come out. The philosopher Heraclitus is one of my favorites through the ages. He said, even the eyes and ears are poor witness to the barbarian soul. What I hear that saying is when we're out of tune with the universe, even our judgments about the world are skew. So if you've been looking at life and feeling hopeless, that's understandable but it may be that what's missing is the, your own creativity. Let me finish Garth Brooks's poem. He said, looking back on the memory of the dance we shared beneath the stars above, for a moment all the world was right. How could I have known you'd ever say goodbye? And now I'm glad I didn't know the way it all would end, the way it all would go. Our lives are better left to chance. I could have missed the pain, but I've had to have missed the dance. There's something about your creativity that makes the trip worthwhile. It's not about getting somewhere. It's not about accomplishing something. It's about you remembering that creative energy that you felt once as a child and that you expressed through some art or something squishing your toes in mud. Who knows what it was? Remember that time. Honor that time. Get as close as you can to that time. And know that your creativity is the best gift you can give this wounded nation. It was Howard Thurman, and I'll close with this, a mentor of Dr. King, who said, if you want to help the world, don't just ask what the world needs. Ask what makes you come alive. Because what this world needs more than anything else is people who have come fully alive. I invite you now to your own reflection on these words.